Welcome to the website for Shelley's Ghost, a major exhibition brought to you from the Bodleian Libraries, University of Oxford, in association with the New York Public Library. Through this collaboration, the Bodleian and the New York Public Library have been able to, to bring together, we think, the greatest exhibition connected with Shelley and his circle that's ever been brought to the public. The exhibition is about really one of England's great literary families, the philosopher William Godwin, his wife, Mary Wollstonecraft, famous as the writer of a Vindication of the Rights of Woman, their daughter, Mary, and Mary's husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, the poet. Well, Shelley was an undergraduate at Oxford. He matriculated in 1810. He was then expelled uh, only the following term for publishing the pamphlet here, The Necessity of Atheism. You can see it's quite an innocent looking pamphlet, but the story goes that he displayed them in the window of a shop in Oxford High Street, and a passing don saw them, went into the shop and demanded that uh, the pamphlets in the window be removed and that the stock be burned. So a brief career, but um, he's now really one of the university's most famous literary alumni, and there's a statue of him at his college, University College. So almost immediately after he was expelled, he eloped with a 16-year-old called Harriet Restbrook. Uh, in doing so, he estranged himself from his family. They went up to Edinburgh, and from Edinburgh to all parts of the country, including Ireland, and Shelley became increasingly committed to radical politics, and he distributed pamphlets, he made speeches, uh, and through the course of his radical um, commitments, he wrote to William Godwin. They started a correspondence, eventually met, and through Godwin, Shelley met Godwin's daughter, Mary. What attracted Shelley to Mary was the fact that she was his intellectual equal. Mary also, of course, had a wonderful literary pedigree as the daughter of William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. So it was a, it was a wonderful, wonderfully creative uh, and intellectual relationship, but also a very tragic one. I mean, here we have portraits, here is of, of Mary Shelley, uh, and one of Percy Bysshe Shelley looking rather angelic as a boy. Um, Tragic relationship in that uh, only one of their children survived into adulthood. And uh, Mary, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley's first wife, Harriet, uh, committed suicide. Um, and it was only after that suicide, in fact, that, that Shelley and Mary Shelley married. They were only together for eight years, and they spent the last four years of their lives together in Italy. Uh, had very little money, were constantly on the move. As I say, two of their children died when they were in Italy. Um, so it was a very intense but rather fraught relationship. Mary Shelley's father, William Godwin, was one of the most celebrated philosophers of the day. Uh, his best known work was called Political Justice, in which he argued that society didn't really need institutions. Man was uh, inherently perfectible, as the term went, um, and so if he was only freed from institutions such as marriage, then he would become perfect. Mary Wollstonecraft uh, was also famous as a writer. Her best known work now, of course, is A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Here's a copy of the first edition. Uh, it aroused very strong feelings, as you can imagine, when it was first published. And in fact, an owner of this edition has written here, I think this book is written in a spirit of retaliation, yet there are many truths. I think that was probably quite a common, common uh, response to the book. Mary Shelley is uh, best known now, of course, as the author of Frankenstein, one of the best known novels in the language. The origins of the novel go back to 1816, when she and Shelley were staying with Lord Byron by Lake Geneva at the Villa Diodati. It was summer, but that year, 1816, Mount Tabora uh, in Indonesia had exploded with enormous force, and so that year was known as the year without a summer. So they were trapped indoors most of the time. Uh, it rained a lot, it was very dark. So they told each other ghost stories. And Mary Shelley later remembered having a dream, uh, which was the germ, if you like, for Frankenstein. Among the greatest treasures of the collection have to be Shelley's working notebooks. Uh, I think the notebooks tell us uh, two things. Uh, Firstly, the, the enormous uh, range and variety of Shelley's thinking. Secondly, uh, 
in his work, he was very much a craftsman. Uh, T.S. Eliot called poetry an intolerable wrestle with words and meaning. And I think uh, Shelley's manuscript uh, notebooks with their crossings out, their, their drafts, their redrafts, their reorganization, show him struggling with words and meanings. Uh, Wordsworth called Shelley uh, the greatest artist of us all, I mean in workmanship of style. So very much a workman, a craftsman. And uh, all those layers of revision uh, can be seen and traced in the notebooks. Well, after Shelley's death, Mary Shelley remained in Italy. And I think it's fair to say that for a while she was almost deranged with grief. Uh, she began what she called her Journal of Sorrow, which we see here. This is the opening of her Journal of Sorrow, and she actually calls it Journal of Sorrow, begun 1822, the year of Shelley's death, uh, and confided to its white, to its white pages, uh, as she says, all her most private thoughts. And she constantly held the image of Shelley in her head. Uh, Shelley, her memory of Shelley, was so intense, she said, that it, it mocked reality. She kept with her um, a dressing case in which she kept locks of hair belonging to Shelley, belonging to William Shelley, uh, the son who died tragically young in Rome, um, a ring that once belonged to her mother, jewelry made out of hair. Um, these are the things, these sort of tangible reminders of her past, which she constantly kept with her. Well, she was forced to return to England in 1823 because Shelley's father, Sir Timothy Shelley, would only support Mary's son, Percy, if he was schooled in England. So they returned to England. In England, Mary Shelley earned her living as best she could by her pen, like her parents did before her. And she also edited Shelley's works. Uh, this was a, a very, very difficult thing to do. Not only were uh, Shelley's notebooks difficult to decipher, it forced Mary Shelley back into the past, so she had to relive a lot of the tragedies of their years together. Uh, she also faced the opposition of Sir Timothy Shelley. Uh, Sir Timothy didn't want any mention of his wayward son in, the, uh, in, in print at all. It's fair to say, I think, that during Shelley's life he had very little reputation at all. After his death, he gradually became more and more well-known, both as a poet and as a man. He once said that the poet and the man are two different natures, and those two aspects of Shelley, his life and his work, have uh, gradually become more and more celebrated and, and, and better known as the years have gone by. After Mary Shelley's death, the great family archive, which by this stage uh, included the papers of Mary Wollstonecraft, of William Godwin, of Shelley, and Mary Shelley herself, so one of the great literary archives um, that there is, passed to her son, her and Shelley's son, Percy Florence, Sir Percy Florence, as he was now, and Jane Lady Shelley, Sir Percy Florence's wife. Uh, they looked after it, um, guarded it jealously, uh, and did all they could to promote the reputation of Shelley and Mary Shelley uh, in ways that they thought the most truthful or the most appropriate. Um, Lady Shelley kept in their house, Boscombe Manor near Bournemouth, a special room which she called her sanctum, the Shelley sanctum, uh, in which she kept the manuscripts in, in bound volumes and personal relics, uh, and in fact the two portraits here, Whenever they could, Sir Percy and Lady Shelley added to the archive by buying um, manuscripts that weren't in the archive. But inevitably, there were things that escaped them. And many of those things are now in the great collection established by Karl Fortzheimer in the first half of the 20th century. And some of those items will be on display in the exhibition. This website is brought to you thanks to the generosity of a number of donors. Especially, we'd like to record our thanks to Dr. Leonard Polonsky, but also to the New York Public Library, to the National Heritage Memorial Fund, who helped us acquire the Avenger Papers, which are at the heart of this exhibition, and to a number of other generous donors. One particularly nice element of the website are podcasts, where we have brought students together to read 
elements of the letters and texts which are available in the exhibition. These students are all at the University of Oxford and are participating in this exhibition in this way for the first time.